Live. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Max uh, from the Finksburg Library. Um, today, we're doing our presentation on uh, monarch butterflies uh, with Adrienne Hubbard from the Monarch Teacher Network. Um, she's very passionate about monarchs, and she came last year, and we're so happy to have her back today. So, Adrienne, whenever you're ready, you can uh, get started. Hello, everybody. You get to be my guinea pigs for my first ever virtual monarch program. Yeah, so congratulations. Glad so glad you're tun tuning in today. And we just, the sun just came out just in time. We escaped the worst of the hurricane. Um, so uh, I have my picture up right now that I'm starting with. Um, first, I want to say a little bit more about myself, though. So my name is Adrian Hubbard, and I'm actually an ESOL teacher with Baltimore City Public Schools. I'm, so I'm not, I don't have a science background, but um, a few years ago, I had the privilege of attending uh, a teacher um, monarch butterfly workshop at Ledoux Gardens right here in Maryland, uh, sponsored by the Monarch Teacher Network. Uh, unfortunately, this summer it was canceled, but it's something I highly recommend if you want to learn more um, and it's for anyone who's an educator or librarian of any kind um, but you can also really just learn all of this yourself as well so we learned about the monarch butterfly the anatomy the life cycle why it's important and special and also how to care for them and how to teach about them um, so I have found it very rewarding um, because it really connects to a lot of things and it gives some hands-on things I can do with my students unfortunately in the time of COVID schools have been closed and, and uh, also um, we, I have had very few monarchs coming to my yard this year so far. Um, so I don't have any live specimens to show you right now, but um, I have um, dozens and dozens of photographs that I've taken myself with my trusty iPhone uh, in some video clips um, of when I was raising them. So it's what I learned from the workshop I went to at Ledoux. And um, so really it's something anyone can do. So you can just enjoy learning about it um, or you can even try it yourself or do it with your kids at home. And most of us have been spending a lot of time at home. Um, okay, so that's part of what I would like to show you is sort of how I learned how to do it. Okay, um, so this first slide is showing you the entire metamorphosis of the monarch butterfly in a nutshell. Um, they go through a complete metamorphosis, meaning they have, they move from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to adult. And it's quite amazing and magical to actually watch this happen. Um, so uh, I will show you photos of all of those stages and they're all photos that I took myself. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the Finksburg Public Library because they had me come uh, last summer uh, and give a live program and uh, they have this wonderful native plant garden, which really makes it possible then to release the, the adult monarch at the end of the program right out into the garden and know that it has what it needs uh, <clears throat> to get some nectar and shelter before it um, goes off to mate and reproduce. Um, so, and Max did a wonderful job of raising um, a caterpillar that I brought in that I had found in my own yard and I put it on a milkweed plant and I gave, gave him enough milkweed for it to last for a while. And it was able to um, make its chrysalis and uh, become an adult and be released. Um, and then this is um, a little shot of part of my program at the Finksburg Public Library. In the background, you can see a slide I have of a chrysalis that was just formed and it's doing its pupa dance and it's this strange gyrating thing it does um, to attach itself um, to securely to the top so it can hang for two weeks. And so uh, I asked for a child to come up and do the pupa dance. So there you see, there's a kid doing it. Um, and we had a good program. And that is also at the Finksburg Public Library. So that's the caterpillar that Max and the staff were caring for and Ooh. shows um, how it, it's, uh, it actually went through its whole life cycle right on the plant, the milkweed plant. And it's in J shape right there, getting to, ready to make its chrysalis. I love that the books are right there in the background. So you can see that it's in the library. <laughs> yeah, people really enjoyed our enclosure. Um, it's sad that we can't uh, show that off. Um, right now. 
And then that is, <clears throat> after my program, we released the adult butterfly that I had brought. Uh, it, it flew off really fast, so I didn't get an actual photo of the butterfly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so starting off with just how beautiful these adult monarchs are, they're very charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a couple of photos to help you understand which gender the butterfly is. So Max, you remember which gender this one is? I think it's a male, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how can you tell? It's got the little spots towards the bottom of its wings, um, right. the black spots. Exactly, so you see two black dots on the hind wings and the black lines on the wings are also kind of on the thin side. If you imagine using a Sharpie marker to write the lines, it would be a fine marker. And then here you have a female, you see, you don't have the spots on the hind wings and the lines are thicker. Okay, so maybe our audience can think to themselves, which gender is this one? <laughs> ah, if you said male, that is correct. <laughs> and this one is in my yard, it's on swamp milkweed plant. Uh, and you see the flowers, they, you always know it's a milkweed plant. You see five petals up and five petals down, like that on the plant. Okay, and then maybe our audience can look at this and figure out which gender it is. Ah, and if you said female, that is correct. And you can see the underside of the wings are much paler and it's a little hard to, harder to identify the gender there. Now in the pictures, you'll see that I never touch the wings um, because the wings are covered in tiny scales and some of the scales come off every time you touch it or it brushes against something. Um, so, but it's fine to let it um, perch on your hand. And you can see uh, the proboscis here on, in this picture. That is the long sort of nose that it, it is like a straw that it uses to get nectar. I'm sorry, I was pointing at the wrong thing there. The one that is aimed down into the flower petal. So it's getting nectar. I have a couple of pictures of different adults because they all look a little different. You can see by the condition of this uh, monarch that it's probably been alive for a while and it's been through some weather. Um, it's, it's lost a lot of its scales and part of its wing, but it was still flying around doing fine. And here's one that was flying around my yard with only two thirds of its wings and it was still flying pretty well. So we all know that insects are supposed to have six legs, right? M Max, do you know why you can only really see four legs on the monarch? Um, doesn't the monarch, um, the legs, like the front legs get like pulled up, like essentially get retooled into something else. Right, so it has two very tiny uh, legs right under its head that are normally folded up and you can't really see them, uh, but they are actually there. Um, and I'll tell you a little more about what they do with those legs. Okay. So when the monarch first comes out of its chrysalis, its, its proboscis or its tongue is in two parts and it uses the little four legs to actually sort of zip it together into one piece. Mm -hmm. Now these two are mating. Um, I didn't actually see that in my yard. This is at the Butterfly House at Ledoux Gardens. So this mm -hmm. is a, a wonderful resource if you don't know about the Butterfly House um, at Ledoux Gardens. And it is open currently. Um, you don't have to make an appointment. Uh, you just can go there. And it is uh, the mission, it has a conservation mission. So it only has local uh, butterflies in the different stages of the metamorphosis that they find uh, around uh, in the meadows right there. So <clears throat> by keeping them in the enclosure, they protect them from some of the predators. Not all, there are apparently some little wasps and things that sometimes get in there. But um, it, without um, uh, protection, most monarchs have about a one in a hundred chance of making it to adulthood out, outside in the wild. Mm -hmm. So um, we, it looks like we have a question here. Um, are monarchs poisonous to predators like birds? 
So um, that's a great question. So because uh, the caterpillar eats the milkweed plant exclusively, um, it uh, gets the toxins from the milkweed, um, the uh, cardio, I uh, forgot the exact name of it, um, <clears throat> the, that white sticky stuff. Um, and it actually is toxic to most birds, um, but not to all the spiders and parrot web uh, wasps and tachinid flies and so on. So it gives it partial protection. That's why um, there's the Viceroy butterfly that has adopted the monarch's coloring and, and uh, to like mimic them so that they think, uh, they think it's a monarch so they won't eat it. Right, so the predators avoid them. Yeah. Right. And so the monarch's bright colors to say to predators, notice me and, and stay away because I'm toxic to you. Mm -hmm. So you may know that um, milkweed plants are the only host plant for the larva, larval form of the monarch. So that is why the female monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweed. And there are several kinds of native milkweeds um, to this area. And one of them is the common milkweed, Asclepia syriacus. Um, and a few years ago, I started a milkweed patch at my school, so down in Baltimore City. So really, you can do this anywhere, even in a container garden, you know, if you live in the city. Um, and there you have one of my first graders who I taught how to very carefully check for eggs under a leaf without um, possibly squashing them. So you're just lift, lifting the tip of the leaf up and looking, because they're usually on the bottom so that they're more protected. And typically only one egg per leaf, just like in the, the picture book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. There are a couple of inaccuracies in that book, but that part's true. However, what I learned from a few years of observing, taking pictures, is that the female does not always lay the egg on the bottom of the leaf. So I'll show you. So here she's laying it on the actual flower buds. The top of the leaf. Oh, okay. I was supposed to have another one there. Um, so they also sometimes lay them on the, the seed pods as mm -hmm. well, but usually the bottom of the leaf. Let's see, we ha do have a question. Do monarchs like all types of milkweed, like butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed as well? I find that in my yard, uh, they always go for the swamp milkweed the most. And I'm not sure why that is. And it may be that for some reason in my yard that the swamp milkweed is healthier. So the female will, will drum her feet on the, the plant and kind of smell it and make sure it's the right kind of plant. And they can, I think they can sense, you know, how healthy the plant is and, and pick and choose what they go to. All right. We, aha. Um... We have a question. Uh, do the caterpillars have two heads? If not, which end is the head? Um, Just one head. And at first, it can be hard to distinguish which one is the head. But I have some good footage of caterpillars that I'll get back to you, to you on that one. So we'll see that. OK. Uh, oh, that's there it is. Yep, yeah, there it is. I have so many photos that I might have an, an errant one out of order. Sorry. OK. How many eggs does the female usually lay? Like, I know she does it one at a time, but. Yeah, um, I believe she has hundreds of eggs. Um, and then when she gets to the end of her life, if she's really desperate to lay those eggs, she, they sometimes engage in egg dumping. So they may end up laying more eggs on one plant. But sometimes, um, I mean, we, Max, you, you and I talked a little bit about, you know, the whole, uh, the challenges that they're facing. Well, one of the challenges is, there's not very much milkweed anymore. So they, if they can't find the milkweed, I, I don't, not sure what they do with all their eggs. Um, and lack of milkweed's not the only issue. It's, it's also lack of um, habitat and lack of um, nectar producing plants throughout the season um, to feed the adults, uh, especially the ones that are gonna migrate um, to Mexico uh, later in the summer, in the fall. Um, they need a, a constant supply of, of food, of nectar throughout that time. Let's see, we got another comment. I've actually seen one coming out of its cocoon or chrysalis. Have I seen it? Um, 
they 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 just commented that they've actually seen one emerge from them. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, it's excellent if you get to actually see it come out of the chrysalis. Yes, and I have a video to show you too of that. It's really cool because it goes from that random green color and gold to the bright orange. It's it's quite unusual. Yeah, it's very beautiful. So this is a little video of a female, and at the end, it's uh, if you pay attention, you'll see it's laying an egg on a leaf. Let's see, while we're watching, we have another question. Do all monarchs migrate to Mexico, even from Maryland? That seems like a really long way. Um, well, not all monarchs are gonna migrate. The ones that are born now uh, will have a shorter lifespan, so two to six weeks. Um, and their job is just to mate and reproduce. Uh, so they're gonna stay local. Um, but the ones who emerge from their chrysalis in um, like late August, September, they um, are gonna go into reproductive diapause and they're not gonna reproduce and they're just going to feed on nectar and they're going to, their flight is gonna be in a southerly direction. So they, yes, they will go all the way to Mexico. Mm -hmm. okay. So here you have a uh, monarch oh. egg. And you get used to, um, when you're checking, uh, if you do uh, end up planting milkweed in your yard or you can go somewhere, if you have friends who have milkweed and you're searching for eggs, at first you start to see all these little white spots and you think, is that one, is that one? But you get used to seeing how it's very distinctive with the, the it looks like a little football with the little pointy mm -hmm. end there. So that's definitely a monarch egg. Okay, so Max, do you know why this monarch egg looks black on the tip? Because that's probably its head. It's gotten clearer and that's probably the head of the caterpillar starting to emerge. Excellent, <laughs> exactly. So when you see this, if you're raising them at home, you know, to keep, keep an eye out, it's going to be hatching soon, exactly. So that's my fingers tip, tip for scale, very tiny. Little eyeball. And there you have the first mm -hmm. star. So it's going to molt uh, four times. Uh, in other words, it's going to shed its skin and it's going to look a little different each time. So the first time you notice it doesn't have its stripes yet and its head is black. And it's going to eat its egg. So this one here was, is about, usually will eat the egg as its first meal. Okay. So then this one is starting to graduate to eating the milkweed leaf. And there's so much toxins in the milkweed sap for that, when they're that size, it's like too much. So sometimes they chew like a little circle to stop the flow of the, of the um, milkweed, uh, milkweed sap and then they eat the middle. So this one's a little bigger. Um, so it has shed its skin and it now has its little tiny antennae. And I remember someone asked where's the, which one is the head and which is the end. So for well, one little clue is sometimes the poop or frass has come out of the end. So there's little dots there are the frass. So the caterpillars um, have a special name for their poop, which sounds much more dignified, right? Brass. Brass. Okay, so Max, do you know what that black stuff is? There. Is that its former skin? Exactly. So this caterpillar just molted, just shed its skin, and the, as soon as the skin comes off, it looks all black and shriveled. Sometimes they eat the skin after they molt too. It gives They're very them tidy. Food. Yeah, right. And well, actually, not. They don't eat their. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took out most of the pictures where there's lots of frass. <laughs> um, and then, do you know what this is on the left here, this round thing? That's its old head. Yeah, head it is. It's the head plate, um, the head covering. Yeah. It's actually a COVID mask that it uh, is saving for later. Ha <laughs> ha. No. Okay. So you can see the antennae are um, still wet. Is it just malted? They're kind of wiggly. 
And this one is at a different stage. It's even bigger. It has these beautiful um, sort of Fred Astaire feet, you know, with the white. That little spats. Yeah. So you can see the tentacles are longer where its head is. So in this one, the, the right side is the head. Um, the tentacles are longer. Uh, you also can, so, also can see that the legs right behind the head look different. They're, um, they have like claws and they're three on each side. So we know insects are supposed to have six legs. So they do have six of these true legs and then these four that look like the Fred Astaire, the pro legs. And then they have one more set of legs at the very end. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it can be confusing because they do have some small, smaller antennae on the back. Okay, so it's nice to see how they move around on the plant outside or inside as well. If you, if you take the whole plant inside, you can see this. So this is a little video. That's a pretty chunky one. Yeah, this one is very close to going to the chrysalis stage. I call them fat cats. <laughs> and that's on a swamp milkweed plant. Mm. Do you have any questions? Let's see. Can the caterpillars hear? I've seen them react to loud sounds in the yard before. That is a really good question. I know that the adults, butterflies, have very poor hearing an excellent sight and smell. So I have to look that up. Okay. Wouldn't be surprised if they could, because I know some, um, some caterpillars actually issue a cry, like if disturbed. So maybe they're in really? the auditory. I think some species do, yeah. Oh, okay. I don't think the monarch caterpillars no. do. If they start talking to me, I think I would have to check myself out. But um, this one is eating, chewing on the leaf. So basically their whole job is to eat and eat and eat. And all they eat is milkweed leaves. Um, and they're supposed to be fattening up because then once they transform into the chrysalis stage, they obviously cannot eat. They're just hanging there. Uh, and then once they're adults, they switch to liquid, liquid only diet. <laughs> so, whoops. So I had some really good ones of them eating, but this one will show you. You can kind of see it's right there chomping on the leaf. Yeah. Perfect for lunchtime. Yeah. Okay, so at uh, one point I only raised them uh, in containers like this. And so uh, each one of these containers has different stages of caterpillars going on. Um, and the top ones, it's hard to see, but there's some chrysalids hanging from the lid there. And that's right after I had cleaned it up. It was a lot of work. That was the dining room table in my house. And that's after one day of not cleaning the frass. And so those brown things are the poop and the frass. So this method is not really very desirable because you don't want the caterpillars to be too close to their excrement. Um, you know, it's got bacteria and things. Um, these caterpillars all did fine. But, um, and it was a lot of work to change. But if you are gonna do it this way, you, um, the, I have a paper towel on the bottom and then I would just uh, carefully remove uh, the leaf that the caterpillar was on and set it down and then change the paper towel and then clean out the container and then put it back. That, this is what you might have to do if you wanna try it, but you do not have a lot of milkweed. If you don't have enough milkweed to cut the whole plant at the base and then put the plant in the, um, a jug, um, then you might need to do it this way. So I would run out to the yard and just take as many leaves as I thought they needed for each day and then change them each day. Then I graduated to taking the whole plant. I had enough milkweed plants growing in my yard. I could do that. So this is in my basement. It's a lot more fun watching the caterpillars on the plant because they're just free to, to crawl around as they want. 
So that's the setup that I like, I prefer that I would recommend. But again, you have to have enough milkweed plants. And I found that if you cut them at the base and you, you cut slits in the bottom of the stem and you put them in water right away, some of the plants would last a week or more and stay pretty fresh. Do we have any more questions at this point? Um, looks like we're good, although someone might chime in. Okay. And that's another way you can do it. Um, that's, a, I believe, a teacher, a different teacher's picture. So when the caterpillar becomes a fat cat, like I said, and it's, it's a, takes about two weeks for it to get to its um, biggest stage, about two inches long. Um, in, when it's out in the wild, sometimes it will do a walkabout and go off the plant, wander around and look for a secure place to attach to. Um, but when it's on the plant, it would just do it on the plant itself. So you can see there's some white stuff that it secretes from its end and it attaches there and it's about to fall, to hang in J shape to get ready to make its chrysalis. Now, the really fascinating part is, I don't know if any of our viewers actually have seen it um, form the chrysalis. So unlike a moth that sort of wraps around a cocoon around itself, then this is the main difference between cocoon and chrysalis. The chrysalis is really where the insides become the outsides. So it kind of looks like uh, something is forming on the outside of it. What it's really doing is like un it's in a suit and it's unzipping that suit and it's inside then hardens into the chrysalis. So this is a fast motion version, time-lapse video. Crazy. Pretty fast, so oh, I'll show it again. So the opening, it starts to split behind its head. So it's hanging upside down with its head down. It starts to split behind its head and it looks like it's moving up. Um, and then the skin just drops down. So now, now I have a real time video. Oh, so it's another fast one, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then it was gyrating around and that's the pupa dance. And you see there's a black cord at the top. And, and uh, when it does the pupa dance, it's really hooking that black cord into all the little silk threads that it made that so it were very, will be very securely attached. Because it's got to hang there for about 14 days while it transforms inside, you know, getting its wings and legs and everything. Okay, so here's a real time. Even in real time, it's still pretty quick sometimes. About two minutes. And now, Max, do you remember what that's called when it does those gyrations? Um, I forget the technical term. Pupa dance. Oh, well, yeah. 
It's not very technical, really. No. There's probably a more scientific word for it, too. Yeah, so the pupa is the stage of the stage of complete metamorphosis. For a moth, the pupa is a cocoon, and for a butterfly, the pupa is a chrysalis. So it's hooking the cremaster, that black hook, more securely into the silk threads by gyrating around like this. And then also the skin, the old skin will fall. Boop. There it goes. And it really, I don't think it can see what it's doing at this point. It's pretty amazing. It's just instinct. I think if someone had invented this as a, uh, a fictional creature, no one would believe that it could be real. Mm -hmm. Let's see. You said, uh, we have a question. You said monarch butterflies have excellent eyesight. Do they recognize people if they see them more than once? No, they're not going to recognize people, but they see mostly light and movement. If they, it just thinks you're a tree. You know, when I when I <laughs> have a perch on my hand, I don't think it really knows you're a person. So this is a fresh chrysalis. You know, can still see it's still wet and it's um, very vulnerable right at this stage because it hasn't hardened yet. Looks like a magician escaping from a straitjacket. The whole process does yes maybe that person can act that out in my next workshop mm -hmm. as a visual mm -hmm. so this is just a little later the shape changes a little bit you can see this is still wet and there's one where the skin didn't fall off but it's no big deal and i just think they're incredibly beautiful and they all look a little different so i like to take pictures of the chrysalis and they don't really know why the gold dots are there. They're just so beautiful. This is one, um, I've only seen a couple of chrysalids actually outside. Um, I've seen, uh, until this summer, I used to have a lot of caterpillars on my milkweed and then they would get fat and all of a sudden they would be gone. And I always wonder where did they make their chrysalis? I don't, I don't know, they found either they got eaten before then or they found good hiding places but this was at a neighbor's house. And this is the only one I've seen on my house, on the electric box on the back porch. Now, if you do engage in rearing monarchs, you are gonna have some heartbreak along the way because there are, part of nature is parasitism and it's not good or bad, it's just the way it is. So the tachinid flies frequently parasitize the caterpillars. So they drill into them, they make little holes in their back and they pretty much eat them from the inside out. And sometimes the caterpillars make it in a, through this to this stage of life, even at, when they're parasitized. Um, and sometimes they die sooner, but the telltale sign that's the tachinid fly is these long strings hanging down. So that is how the tachinid fly larva exits the host body. And then it makes its own little pupa. But there's also it's a lot of times where they just die from bacterial diseases and different things like that. I have a friend, yeah, so. Sometimes they come out and they, when they emerge, they're deformed and you really should not try to save them because this is, um, you know, the survival of the fittest and you don't really want them in the gene pool. So when, um, <clears throat> when I started raising them on the plants themselves, sometimes they weren't ready to emerge, but the plant was getting too old and the leaf was about to drop off. So you don't want the chrysalis to fall um and get damaged so i um a friend helped me devise this method of i would cut the milkweed leaf off and then clip it to a string that i had tied inside the enclosure and that worked really well now you can remove the chrysalis from something and you then you attach the silk thread to like a piece of tape so that's what a friend had done on the right you can see on the on the left and right sides I'm a little wary of doing that because I, I don't, really don't want to handle it, but um, you can do it that way. So Max, do you notice, notice anything about the crystals here? It's starting to turn transparent. You can and see, see its wings. 
Yeah. So it starts to look like that. And then when it gets to this stage, so it takes 12 to 14 days to get to this stage. Um, when you see it like that, if you are rearing them, you really need to pay attention because it's probably going to emerge pretty soon. Um, and the technical word for emerging is eclose. Okay, so here's, I believe the um, fast version of eclosing. Now, Max, did you ever get to see, did you actually get to see that yourself? I don't think I saw it emerge, but I think a few others at the branch might have. It happened really quickly. Yeah, that's faster than the chrysalis formation. Mm -hmm. You have to really be right there or you miss it. Okay, so I think this is going to be the real time e closing. Yep. I believe this was in my classroom at school. I believe I had set up my smartphone on a little stand and I was just waiting, waiting. It took a couple years before I got, was able to capture these on film. You can see that it gets, it's the first thing that gets out is are its legs because it's got to hold on to that chrysalis case. If it falls, now it's doomed because its wings are not going to be able to dry and form correctly. Yeah, the wings come out pretty small and crumpled. Yeah, and they're wet. Let's see if that's a male or a female. Nope, that's in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't really see the hind wings. The back yet. No. Yeah. Guess it's a female. The end of their abdomen does look a little different on the male. It has little things that they use to grasp the female during um, mating. Now, if you look carefully, you can see the proboscis is going in and up and down. You can see the little forelegs. They look bent. And yeah. we're putting them together. Um, so Max, uh, do you know why the wings are so small? And what happens to the wings? Um, I believe they take a lot of that excess fluid and they actually like fill like the wings and the dries, like it, they're crumpled and then it needs to be essentially inflated, I think. Or, yeah, so, so yeah. to fit into the chrysalis, they were all folded up, right? Mm. And so they come out, they're still kind of crumpled and then it pumps the fluid exactly through the wings. And so the wings are not actually technically growing. They're just kind of like inflating with the fluid, yeah. The adult doesn't grow, actually grow anymore once it uh, emerges. And did you notice that it also was turning? And so it's trying to dry its wings faster. And it takes about 15 minutes or so, but usually they're not ready for flying for another hour or so. A lot depends on the temperature. If they're in the sun on a really hot day, their wings are gonna dry much faster. Um, but I always let them decide when they're ready. And then some of that fluid, the, the waste fluid that was in the <clears throat> chrysalis with them that, that comes out. So if you're rearing them and you see this fluid come out, don't be alarmed. That's totally normal. So it's going to hang there 
on the chrysalis case. It, it knows it needs to wait. I believe I have, this is um, to show you the proboscis coming out when it first emerges. You can kind of see it's in two pieces, I believe. It's using the little forelegs to zip it together into one piece. All right, let's see, we have a question from Sandy McGregor. Uh, what is the time length from an egg being laid until a butterfly emerges from the chrysalis? Um, what is the general monarch lifespan? Okay, so the life cycle takes about a month. And that's the same for whether, regardless of whether it's a one that's going to migrate and live longer or not. But that, that part is about the same length the of time. The whole process. Yeah, um, the whole process of metamorphosis, yeah. Um, the life cycle in terms of how long they live as adults is totally different dependent on what time they're born. Whether they're born in the summer and they're only gonna mate and not migrate, they have a much shorter lifespan. If they're born later in the late summer and fall, they're gonna migrate, so they live up to nine months. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the monarchs are a tropical butterfly. They didn't, um, in, originally, they didn't migrate at all. That was something they evolved to do to expand its range. So the tropical ones um, have a short lifespan and um, they're, they're not migrators. The thing that we're, when they talk about uh, monarchs are endangered, they're not, they don't mean all monarchs, they mean the migrating population. So if we didn't have monarchs that migrated, we would never see them here in Maryland. They would only be in like Mexico and Central America. Um, I might need to speed this along a little. I just, um, with this video is to show you mainly that it's safe to have it perching on your finger or, or so on. I got quite fascinated with photography with these and wanting to see it close up. Um, it's better if you don't handle them. Like if, if, you, if you haven't been trained, so you know the best thing is to not handle them at all. But um, it, it, the legs don't get injured by, they, 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 like I said, they just think you're a stick or a tree. So if you put your finger out, it's gonna grasp it and just hang there. An empty chrysalis case, that's in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. It was really fun coming down and seeing all of these butterflies had emerged early in the morning. Now, the one thing though I should say is that I did, um, if you are rearing them and it is the late summer and fall, it's better to rear them outside. So there's new research that shows that um, rearing them indoors can kind of dis disorient them and make it harder for them to migrate properly because they need to be exposed to the outdoor conditions with the right humidity and light and dark and things like that. Um, but um, for educational purposes, um, you know, for the non-migrating uh, ones, I, I would do it indoors. I would take it to school. That's my classroom. Of course, the kids love it. Very engaging. Mm -hmm. And it's great for libraries. Very much so. We, we had a lot of people interested. We had a whole little station. Um, and we had like a bunch of chrysalises that you had given us and it was, it was very, very popular. Yeah, and what I love is that it's a way to get people more in tune with nature. And especially these days, um, a lot of kids, they're on their devices, they, they don't go outside. Um, and they um, just naturally gravitate towards it. And then when you have a connection with something, then you care about it. And you teach them about then the importance of Every, everything outdoors is habitat, even the schoolyard, even the concrete playground, everything is habitat. And when we see an insect, we just don't want to smash it. I, I think there's a lot of people, as soon as they see an insect, they just want to kill it. And that's part of our culture. That, And we have a worldwide dying off of, of insects that's quite alarming um, due to habitat loss, um, herbicides and pesticides. Um, climate change and climate change is actually a huge problem for the migrating monarchs because um, they depend on very specific w overwintering grounds in uh, Mexico uh, where it has to be just the right temperature. So if it rains a lot, which it's doing more now, and then it freezes, 
that is what kills them off quickly because they get ice on them. If they just get a little cold, they can tolerate that. But if they're wet and cold and covered in ice, that's what kills them. So that's important too. Um, there's also logging of the forest there, even though some of those sanctuaries are protected. Um, some of the locals, uh, they need the firewood and things like that. And I took it to the Patterson Park Manager, the public library, Enoch Pratt Library, which is near my school. And one of the most enjoyable things is if you rear them is to just have it fly off your hand. It's just so delicate. This is really fun. There you go. Good job. They go pretty high, don't they? Yes. So they they know they need to protect themselves. They go. Yeah, they usually go straight up. Now, sometimes if they're um, they they're newly emerged and it's not it's like a cloudy day or it's a cold day, they will really need to warm themselves up. You'll see them actually shake to warm themselves up be able to fly that uh, strongly. And they open and close their wings a lot. Yeah, where they actually even shiver sometimes mm. if they're too cold. Um, but yeah, so doing this kind of thing, if you've had training, it, it's not gonna hurt them. Um, but this again is, these are butterflies that I actually reared and they just recently emerged. You're not gonna wanna catch, I wouldn't recommend to, the, to our viewing audience that you find a live one flying around and try to catch it. Um, unless you've really been trained because you could injure it because you're going to end up touching its wings. Now, the exception to that is that people who have been trained, um, you, there's a thing called tagging. And this is actually the whole way that they learned where that they learned that the monarchs migrate and where they migrated to is through tagging. I myself don't feel comfortable doing it because I feel like I'm going to hurt them, <laughs> but it is possible to do this without hurting them. So um, this is something you can learn to do. Um, they're monarchwatch.org. They have the little tags so that each butterfly would get its own unique um, number, and then you record the date, location, and the number, and you to a database. And um, if anyone finds that butterfly in Mexico or somewhere else later, they will add that to the database, and then it gives more information about their migration behavior. Um, and so this is called citizen science, and this is critically important, and um, something I hope to do more of. But it does take a little more work and training to do it. So you have, there's a certain way that you have to learn how to hold them when you do this so that you do not injure them. And there's one that has been released that had been tagged. So the, the actual sticker does not hurt it. And there's uh, last summer, so the last few summers I've gone as a volunteer to help with the workshop that they normally have every August at Ledoux Gardens, um, which I, again, highly recommend. Now, the other thing to remember is there's constantly new things that we're learning about monarch behavior and migration. And sometimes the um, people get emotional about the correct rearing methods and whether you should tag them or not, and things like that. So it's always evolving. And um, I think the best thing is to err on the side of caution if you're not sure that something is safe to do. But as far as the most people who are not actually going to rear them, the best thing you can do to help them is to refrain from using herbicides and pesticides in your yard uh, to plant native plants. It does not have to be milkweed, any, any even annuals like zinnias that create a lot of nectar for the adults is beneficial. Um, and um, I don't know, do what you can to um, maybe reduce your carbon footprint. Um, we had a question um, from Connie. Uh, what is the timing for tagging monarchs migrating south for our area? So um, the ones that are tagged are only the ones that are actually going to migrate. So you don't, they don't, Monarch Watch does not issue the tags until a certain date. So I think that they, through their research, they determine that date each year and then they send it to you. And um, so when they, normally it's like mid August and later those, uh, those monarchs are going to migrate. Um, I have found monarchs in my yard as late as maybe November 
Um, so they're obviously, then, they're definitely going to be migrating because they cannot withstand temperature. They cannot fly when it's below like 55 degrees. And uh, all butterflies are late this year due to our cold, cool spring, it seems like. Yeah, I, I haven't had time to do the research on, you know, why there's so few right now in the, our area, but definitely there's been a, very few of any kind of butterfly around here. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of the Ledoux Gardens Butterfly House, which is, you can see the people inside. So it's, it's not, it's, it's um, just a screen sort of mesh. So it's like being outdoors. And you can see all kinds of species of butterflies and moths in there. That's just another picture of plants. Okay, and a picture of, if you wanted to rear them, a way you could do it outside. And so they just go to the top. They always go up to find a place to hang. That I wouldn't recommend because um, you could see this is metal and it's hard. So every now and then they fall off the chrysalis when their wings are not fully formed and dried yet. Mm -hmm. so, this, so it was good to have just the mesh and then keep an eye on it. And if you see that happen, you just put your finger and it will crawl on your finger and then you can just let it crawl into something else that can hang from. Just one more little picture of it flying away. And that's basically all I have. I don't want to overdo the talking and information overload. Um, let's see if any of our viewers have any few questions. It looks like we do have a little bit of time for some question and answer if people have anything. Um, so thank you once again, Adrian, for uh, coming and talking about them. With us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, so, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? We'll wait for a minute. I know I take a long time to type. Uh, what is the main difference um, when telling the, between a monarch and a viceroy? Or viceroy, viceroy. Oh, I wish I had a picture handy, but the viceroy has a s stripe. Uh, on the hind wings is different. And I think they're a little smaller. There have been actually a couple of books, um, published books on monarchs that actually have pictures of viceroys <laughs> in the, on the cover. So some things get past the editors, so just take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen an actual viceroy butterfly though. They might not be in this area. Um, yeah, we'll wait one minute, see if anybody else has anything uh, left to ask. I know if I was typing out a question, it would take me quite a while. <laughs> Is Amber, okay, that's it for questions. All right. All right. Well, thank you guys, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I hope people, um, you know, tune in and uh, watch this. It's going to be posted all across our social media. Um, and be available to there. Oh, one more, one more. <laughs> How valuable is a nectar plant in a habitat once emerged? I don't put them in mind, but see others doing this. So like putting like a, like sprig of like Agastaki or, or something like in the, in the enclosure, is that what you meant, Connie? Oh, no, you don't need to do that because they no. don't eat for about a day after they emerge. Um, it's That would be only, the only time that I've seen um, pe people doing that is the the um, the workshop leaders, the monarch butterfly workshop leaders. They go from New Jersey to Maryland to do the workshop, and they bring a bunch of adults with them. And they the workshop is over three days, so they need to keep them in an enclosure. And they bring um, some like sugar water for them, mm. but you don't need to get them to feed because they will do that as soon as they once they fly out. You don't want to keep them in captivity. Um, sorry, I just got a phone call. You don't want to keep them <laughs> in captivity 
for more than a day, ideally. They could last. Well, I had a couple of times when it, the weather was really bad, you know, really bad thunderstorms, and they cannot fly in the rain. So I kept them for about two days, and they were fine. Two or three days, maybe, you know, if it's not safe to release them. All right, good question. That's a great last question. All right, so I think I'm, you know, I you think- can actually feed them, but I tried it once and it really scared me. I didn't want to handle it. No. There's a certain, you can learn how to do it where you, you do- Like a dropper. Sugar water, but you have to, you have to, they, it's not a natural feeding situation for them. So they don't know how to do it so that their proboscis won't come out. Sometimes it's sometimes mm. you have to take a toothpick and uncurl their proboscis and like hold them next to the sugar water. So I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Long process. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Adrian. I hope people really enjoy and they learn a lot um, from this presentation. I'm so glad that we were able to offer it today. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.